Ethics, Values, Morals. This lecture is not designed to develop your values for you. You already have them. You've been developing them your whole life. Rather, it is designed to help you identify the values you already possess. Then you can decide which ones you want to keep. Ethics is the way we treat ourselves. It's the rationale or principles upon which we base our moral decisions. They govern our behavior. Many of us belong to groups that have a code of ethics. This basically sets expectations for the group so we know um, how to, to relate with one another because you have to work together. Values are the worth or importance we assign to those ethical principles. They give us direction, they influence what we do. If we value our commitment to a monogamous relationship more than sexual fulfillment, then we will resolve a conflict between the two by choosing not to have an extramarital relationship. If we seek fulfillment more highly, then we will resolve the same conflict differently. Our values mature along with us. They are learned. We learn them from our parents, friends, school, books, TV, religion. Our morals are what are right or good. We say that is moral or wrong or bad. We say that is immoral. So who's, decide if, who's to decide if we are doing something that's moral or immoral? Only us. If we were to determine that for somebody else, that would be considered immoral. Your book also talks about a hedonist. That's person, a person that sees pleasure as the highest good. And then another term is asceticism, which means celibacy. Some widely accepted moral principles are we have the, the right to not be forced, to non-coercion, the right to not be lied or tricked, which is non-deceit. Um, the uh, principle of treatment of people as ends. Nobody wants to be an end product. We want to be valued as individuals. And then the principle of respect for our beliefs. What is ethics? The term ethics is derived from the Greek word ethos, which originally means custom or character. Broadly construed, ethics is a branch of philosophy that studies the rightness or wrongness of a human action. In particular, this branch of philosophy is concerned with questions of how human persons ought to act and the search for a definition of right conduct and the good life. It is for this reason that the attempt to seek the good through the aid of reason is the traditional goal of ethicists. It must be noted, however, that there is no single absolute definition of ethics. This is because ethics as a discipline is constantly evolving as a result of a change in socio-cultural and political context. For example, in the Greek tradition, ethics was conceived as relating to the concept of the good life. Thus, the ethical inquiry during this time was directed toward discovering the nature of happiness. In fact, Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics does not only present a theory of happiness but also provides ways in which happiness is attained. Now, centuries later, a quite different orientation was introduced by the Judeo-Christian tradition. In this ethical tradition, the ideals of righteousness before God and the love of God and neighbor, not the happy or pleasant life, constitute the substance of ethics. Indeed, if we make an effort to reconcile these views we are faced with the difficult task of defining the relationship between doing what is right and being happy. Again, it is for this reason that we cannot have an absolute definition of ethics. The least that we can do, in my opinion, is to describe the nature and dynamics of ethics based on a specific time and context. It is also important to note that ethics is not the same with morality. Although many philosophers believe that the two terms can be used interchangeably, this is because the former denotes the theory of right action and the greater good, while the latter indicates practice, that is, the rightness or wrongness of a human action. In other words, ethics undertakes the systematic study of the underlying principles of morality. 
Hence, it is interested primarily in the illustration of a more general problem and the examination of underlying assumptions and the critical evaluation of moral principles. Morality, on the other hand, is more prescriptive in nature. It tells us what we ought to do and exhorts us to follow the right way. According to Terence McConnell, morality is characterized as an end-governed rational enterprise whose object is to equip people with a body of norms that make for peaceful and collectively satisfying coexistence by facilitating their living together and interacting in a way that is productive for the realization of the general benefit. For example, a religious leader may ask her followers to be good at all times. In this way, a moralist may want to keep alive the values she considers to be worthwhile and to improve the moral quality of the community where she belongs. Hence, morality, at the very least, aims to guide one's action by reason and gives equal weight to the interests of each individual affected by one's decision. Indeed, this gives us a picture of what it really means to be a morally upright person. And so, we may conclude that ethics is the science of morals, while morality is the practice of ethics. During the mid-20th century, according to Sumner, a certain theory in the methodology of ethics has gradually become more and more widely accepted, at least by British and American moral philosophers. According to this position, there are two ways of doing ethical inquiry namely normative ethics and meta-ethics. On the one hand, normative ethics is prescriptive in nature, as it seeks to set norms or standards that regulate right and wrong or good and bad conduct. This may involve articulating the good habits that we should acquire, the duties that we should follow, or the consequences of our behavior on others. Hence, Normative ethics normally attempts to develop guidelines or theories that tell us how we ought to behave. For example, Immanuel Kant's claim that an act is morally right if it is done for the sake of duty is an example of a normative ethics. Meta-ethics, on the other hand, is descriptive in nature. According to Sumner, Meta-ethics is allegedly constituted, at least in part, by questions of the meanings of the various ethical terms and functions of ethical utterances. Hence, if a normative ethical inquiry is evaluative and prescriptive, meta-ethics is analytical and descriptive. Put simply, meta-ethics is a type of ethical inquiry that aims to understand the nature and dynamics of ethical principles. It asks questions about the nature and origin of moral facts as well as the way in which we learn and acquire moral beliefs. Thus, for example, if normative ethics urges us to do good at all times, meta-ethics asks the question, what is good? For sure, if a moral philosopher attempts to address the questions, what is good, what is justice, why should I be moral? then that moral philosopher is doing meta-ethics. Hence, when Plato proposed an answer to the question, why should I be moral, Plato was doing meta-ethics. Indeed, Plato raised a meta-ethical question. In the course of the development of ethics, applied ethics became its third major type. As its name suggests, Applied ethics is the actual application of ethical or moral theories for the purpose of deciding which ethical or moral actions are appropriate in a given situation. For this reason, casuists, that is the adherents of applied ethics, are concerned with individual moral problems such as abortion or euthanasia and attempt to resolve the conflicting issues that surround these particular moral problems. Casuists may also act on some occasions in an advisory capacity, such as guiding individuals in their choice of actions. For example, they may attempt to resolve the conflicting duties of a mother suffering from ectopic pregnancy 
who has no other option than to abort the fetus. Applied ethics is usually divided into different fields. For example, we may talk about business ethics, which deals with ethical behavior in the corporate world, biomedical and environmental ethics, which deal with issues relating to health, welfare, and the responsibility we have toward people in our environment, and social ethics, which deals with the principles and guidelines that regulate corporate welfare within societies. Finally, the difference between the three major types of ethics can be illustrated in the following situation. A police officer shoots a terrorist who is about to blow up a crowded shopping mall. The act of the police officer is morally wrong according to meta-ethics, because it is always wrong to kill. As is well known, killing in itself is intrinsically wrong. However, if the police officer does not shoot the terrorists, many innocent people will die or get injured. Though the police officer's act may be wrong, the adherents of a normative ethics may say that it is the right thing to do in this particular situation because not doing so will result in the death of so many people. Hence, the action might be morally correct. Finally, the casuists may say that the police officer is just doing his best to fulfill his duty, that is, to protect as many innocent lives as possible. Utilitarianism Utilitarianism is an ethical theory that determines right from wrong by focusing on outcomes. It is a form of consequentialism. Utilitarianism holds that the most ethical choice is the one that will produce the greatest good for the greatest number. It is the only moral framework that can be used to justify military force or war. It is also the most common approach to moral reasoning used in business, because of the way in which it accounts for costs and benefits. However, because we cannot predict the future, it's difficult to know with certainty whether the consequences of our actions will be good or bad. This is one of the limitations of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism also has trouble accounting for values such as justice and individual rights. For example, assume a hospital has four people whose lives depend upon receiving organ transplants, a heart, lungs, a kidney, and a liver. If a healthy person wanders into the hospital, his organs could be harvested to save four lives at the expense of one life. This would arguably produce the greatest good for the greatest number, but few would consider it an acceptable course of action, let alone the most ethical one. So. Although utilitarianism is arguably the most reason-based approach to determining right and wrong, it has obvious limitations. Deontology Deontology is an ethical theory that uses rules to distinguish right from wrong. It is often associated with philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant believed that ethical actions follow universal moral laws, such as don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat. Deontology is simple to apply. It just requires that people follow the rules and do their duty. This approach tends to fit well with our natural intuition about what is or isn't ethical. Unlike consequentialism, which judges actions by the results, Deontology doesn't require weighing the costs and benefits of a situation. This avoids subjectivity and uncertainty because you only have to follow set rules. Despite its strengths, rigidly following deontology can produce results that many people find unacceptable. For example, suppose you're a software engineer and learn that a nuclear missile is about to launch that might start a war. You can hack the network and cancel the launch, but it's against your professional code of ethics to break into any software system without permission. And it's a form of lying and cheating. Deontology advises not to violate these rules. However, in letting the missile launch, thousands of people will die. 
So, following the rules makes deontology easy to apply. But it also means disregarding the possible consequences of our actions when determining what is right and what is wrong. Want to become a virtuous person? Virtual ethics. Virtual ethics is part of normative ethics. Its founding father is Aristotle. Virtual ethics emphasizes the role of character and virtue rather than either doing one's duty or acting in order to bring about good consequences. A virtual ethicist would likely give you the moral advice act as a virtuous person would act in your situations. Virtual ethics theories deal with questions such as how should I live? What is the good life? And what are proper family and social values? Virtue is a character trait, that is, a disposition which is well entrenched in its possessor, something that goes all the way down. Hence, a virtue such as kindness or generosity is not just a tendency to do what is kind or generous, nor is it to be helpful specified as a desirable or morally valuable character trait. It is concerned with many other actions as well, with emotions and emotional reactions, choices, values, desires, perceptions, attitudes, interests, expectations, and sensibilities. For example, an honest person cannot be identified simply as one who practices honest dealing and does not cheat. If such actions are done merely because the agent thinks that honesty is the best policy, or because they fear being caught out rather than through recognizing to do otherwise would be dishonest as a relevant reason, they are not the actions of an honest person. An honest person cannot be identified simply as one who always tells the truth, nor even as one who always tells the truth because it is the truth. The honest person recognizes that would be a lie as a strong reason for not making certain statements in certain circumstances and gives due weight to that would be the truth as a reason for making them. However, every virtue can easily become a fault if not correctly applied. For instance, someone's compassion might lead them to act wrongly, to tell a lie they should not have told, for example, in their desire to prevent someone else's hurt feelings. For Aristotle, being virtuous meant avoiding this kind of extreme by following the path between two vices, that of not applying a virtue enough and that of applying it too much. He called this finding the mean of a virtue. For example, courage is the mean between cowardliness and recklessness. This is where practical wisdom comes in. Practical wisdom involves the understanding of what is required in a particular situation in light of a general understanding of what is good. One must not only understand the situation, which can involve considerable sensitivity, but also understand how to act well in it. Author John Broadshow puts it in his book, Reclaiming Virtue, Practical Wisdom, is the ability to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Someone who is practically wise is he who understands what is truly worthwhile, truly important, and thereby truly advantageous in life who know, in short, how to live well. In the Aristotelian eudaimonist tradition, this is expressed in the claim that they have a true grasp of eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is openly acknowledged as the concept of happiness, something like true or real happiness, or the sort of happiness worth seeking or having. Living a life in accordance with virtue is necessary for eudaimonia. Hence, in virtue ethics, Human life devoted to physical pleasure or the acquisition of wealth is not your diamond, but a wasted life. Now, to put things in a better perspective, virtual ethics is a character-centered ethical system where one should strive to be a virtuous person. Virtue is a disposition or a character trait that is deeply rooted in its possessor. Practical wisdom is the ability to do the right thing upon certain situations and be able to find the mean of a virtue and avoid it, its extremes. But the ultimate goal of living a virtuous life is to achieve eudaimonia, which is a moralized concept of happiness or the happiness worth seeking or